What I want to do this morning is a guided contemplation. So when you sit down to meditate, there are two things you can do. You can meditate or you can contemplate. Um, the usual definition of meditation in the Buddhist realm is meditation is getting quiet and observing with no words or very few words. So if you're following your breathing and not using one of the aids, no words, you're just observing your breath. It's mindfulness of breathing, breathing meditation. Uh, if you're doing metta, well, you might be using words if you're using the phrases, but it's a restricted set of words. It's not the usual sort of thinking. Uh, if you're using counting, following the breath, yeah, it's, it's a restricted set of eight words. Or if you're doing uh, breathing in peace, breathing out love, well, it's two words. So these would be meditations. If you're doing a body scan, you can do that without words at all. In fact, it's going to work better if there's no words. But contemplation involves actually thinking, you know, sitting down and thinking about a topic, trying to understand, okay, what's really going on in relationship to this topic. So there's not only words, there's sentences, paragraphs, whole chapter, right? And this can be very insightful. Now, the concentration can be geared primarily towards, uh, the meditation can be geared primarily towards concentration or primarily towards insight or both, okay? Uh, if you're using a mantra, uh, just reciting a mantra, Om Mani Padme Hum, over and over again. Uh, that's a meditation, and it's geared strictly for concentration. If you're doing metta, that could bring uh, concentration, but it could also bring some insight as well. The breath could bring both. Uh, body scan could bring both. So... Meditation could be either for concentration or for insight or for both. But contemplation is only for insight. Because of all those words and sentences and paragraphs, you're not going to get as concentrated. Uh, so it's not useful for concentration, but it's very helpful for insight. So I would also say that contemplations tend to work best after you've done some concentration. When you're doing a meditation, it's fairly easy to tell when you get distracted. I mean, if you're following your breath and the next thing you know, you're in Hawaii, yeah, you're distracted, all right? When you're doing a contemplation, because you're thinking, if you start thinking about Hawaii, you might think that you're thinking about Hawaii as part of the contemplation. Well, probably not, okay? So it's trickier to tell when you're doing a contemplation when you've gotten distracted. So it's helpful to have done some concentration before starting a contemplation because this will reduce the tendency to get distracted. But about the only clue you have that you are distracted when doing a contemplation is that you just get off topic. Contemplations always have a topic. You're contemplating, well, whatever, old age, sickness, death, all right? And if you get off topic, then, yep, that's a distraction. Relax, come back to the topic. So what we're going to do today is the five daily recollections. These are five things that the Buddha said everyone should do every day. Five things to remember every day. And the way we're going to do it is I'm going to start the meditation and give you a few minutes to get concentrated, at least a little bit. And then I will say a sentence 
and then you are to repeat it out loud. You don't need to turn on your mic, just, you know, repeat it out loud. I will have my eyes open and I can see your mouth moving. All right. And then I'll say a few things about it that can be helpful for remembering or figuring out how to think about it, how to contemplate it. And I'll give you some time to think about it. And then I'll say the next one and you repeat it out loud. Okay. So in order to begin, please put your attention on your breath for a few moments. I am of the nature to grow old. I am not exempt from aging. Now, the first thing to think about, is this true? Have you noticed yourself growing older? Are there signs? of your aging process. And if there are, how do you feel about that? Do you try and pretend it's not happening? Do you try and cover up signs of aging? Just, yeah, what's your attitude towards living in a body that, yeah, is just not working and looking as good as it used to. It's aging, getting old, decaying.
I am of the nature to become ill. I am not exempt from illness. So is this true? Do you ever become ill? Then if you're ill, does that seem like it's wrong? Shouldn't be happening? And if you're not ill, do you ever appreciate your good health? Or do you just take it for granted? And if you do become ill, are you afraid you'll never recover? Do you fall into fear? And if you're having good health, are, are you just assuming it's going to be like that forever? What is your attitude towards living in a body that sometimes becomes ill. I am of the nature to die. I am not exempt from death. Could this be true? Do you actually believe that you're going to die someday? Does that frighten you? Do you ever think about your own death? Or you just try and pretend it's not going to happen? Do you wish it wouldn't happen? Just what is your attitude towards death? What's it like living in a body that eventually is going to wear completely out and die.
all that is mine, dear and delightful, will change and vanish. Could this be true? Have there been dear and delightful things in your life that have changed and vanished? If so, how did you feel about that? What do you hold as dear and delightful these days? Could today's dear and delightful things change and vanish? If they were to do so, how would you react? What's it like knowing that all the dear and delightful things of your life, people, places, things, can change and vanish? This last one has multiple parts. I'll give them to you one at a time. I am the owner of my karma. I am born of my karma. I live supported by my karma. I am related to my karma. All that I do, whether good or evil, that I will inherit. So the word karma actually means action. And what the Buddha is saying is that all that we own is our actions and their results. So actions have consequences. How aware are you of possible consequences whenever you act? Do you think carefully or you just act because it seems like a good idea? It seems the Buddha is really saying that we need to really pay attention when we act, not just in the act, not just the motivation behind the act, but at what possible outcomes could be. So how careful are you with the fact that actions have consequences?
So, five cheery little things to think about every day. Uh, I just pasted them into a chat for you, so you can copy and paste them if you want to out of the chat window. Um, but yeah, these things are, well, they're the rules of the game. This is how reality works. Uh, yeah, we get old, sick, and die. Dear and delightful things and people and places change and sometimes vanish. And actions have consequences. If you ignore the rules of the game, it generally doesn't go very well. I mean, let's say you're learning to play chess. And, you know, it's complicated. These pieces can move that way and that piece can move this way. And, and you decide to simplify things. You're only going to move your pieces one square at a time. Right? Makes it simpler. Okay? Uh, of course, pretty soon your opponent comes swooping across the board, takes your queen. You get all upset. Your opponent says, but the rules say I can do this. And you're like, oh, yeah, right. And so you go back to moving your pieces one square at a time. And the next thing you know, you're checkmated. Ignoring the rules of the game doesn't work very well. We are inhabiting bodies that are growing older and eventually grow old. If you look in a mirror today, it's probably the best you're going to look for the rest of your life. You know, it just goes downhill from here, all right? Same thing tomorrow. Uh, so what are you going to do about this? Is there anything you can do about this? Well, I like John Glenn. He said, old age is a matter of attitude and exercise. So, yeah, <laughs> you're going to have to do some exercise to stay fit. Uh, you're going to have to eat well. But even then, the changes are inevitable, and it's your attitude that's going to help you deal with the fact that your body is, well, wearing out. When Ayakema did this one, she said, I am of the nature to decay. I am not exempt from decay. Because that's what's happening to us. Things just aren't working as well. You're going to have to come to terms with it. Or aging is going to be a dukkha-filled process. Right? The dukkha, remember, is arising because of your reaction to what's happening. If your reaction yeah, as to push away something that you can't push away, then, yeah, that's craving for something that you're not going to get and you're going to experience dukkha. So you need to come to terms with the fact that you're inhabiting a body that's, yeah, wearing out. I am of the nature to become diseased, right? Ill, not exempt from dis-ease. Yeah, we get sick. We become ill. Uh, does it seem like a tragedy every time you get a cold? Of course, it's probably really scary now. You get a cold and you go, going, is this COVID? But recognizing that we have bodies that have a tendency to become ill is one of the things that enables us to not become ill. Uh, you recognize, yeah, there's a pandemic on. If I go outside the house, I need to wear a mask. This is one way to avoid becoming ill. It's like, yeah, I'm not going to go to the movies, right? That's not a really good thing to do, sit inside with a bunch of strangers. Uh, yeah, you recognize that you have this nature to become ill. And so you take appropriate circumstances, appropriate actions. But even then, no matter what you do, you still might become ill, suffer dis-ease. When you're ill, 
what's it like? You keep hoping it'll go away. You know, you take 5,000 vitamin C, whatever, right? You lay in bed and watch daytime TV. You know, I hear people saying, when I die, I want to be able to meditate. But you got a cold now. And, oh, you can't meditate. You're watching Oprah or whatever they have on day daytime TV these days. I mean, I strongly suspect that dying is going to be a lot more challenging than having a cold. How come if you get a cold, you're not thinking, oh, there's a great opportunity to meditate under adverse circumstances. So I can do it when I die. Nah, you don't want to do that watch cat videos on YouTube or something, right? And who wakes up in the morning and goes, hey, I feel good. I'm not, I'm not ill. This is great. I mean, yeah, nobody thinks like that. But do you appreciate your good health? Sometimes you do after you've been really ill, right? And you're like, oh yeah, it feels good to be well again. How long does that last? Maybe as long as you were ill. But yeah, you just take for granted once you get healthy again, it's gonna stay like that. Well, probably not. You know, how are you gonna deal with it? This is part of having a body like this. I am of the nature to die. I'm not exempt from death. Th this is the one piece of information that we have about the future that we can be absolutely certain of. I mean, you may be certain that, you know, after this finishes, you're going to go eat, but, you know, there might be some asteroid comes right through your house before we finish this session and you're dead, didn't get to eat, All right? You, we know we're going to die. And what do we do with this piece of information that's certain? Ignore it to the best of our ability. Actually, pretty much every spiritual tradition says that you should pay attention to the fact that you're going to die. Uh, Don Juan said, keep death over your shoulder. Knowing that you have a limited amount of time here and you're not dead yet, may help you set your priorities, right? The, given the fact you're not dead yet, what are you going to do with the time you've got left? I mean, you could try and watch all the cat videos on YouTube. Uh, maybe you could find something that's a little bit better to do with your limited amount of time. And knowing that you're going to die when you're having a very nice, positive experience, maybe you can appreciate how precious that positive experience is. It ain't going to go on like this forever. Knowing that you're going to die sets your priorities, right? It's a limited amount of time, but it's some amount of time. What are you going to do with it? All that is mine, dear and delightful, will change and vanish. On that first retreat with Ayakema, when she did this guided contemplation and got to that one, my reaction was, no! I mean, I didn't want that. I had lots of dear and delightful things in my life at that time, and I did not want them to change and vanish. But now, <laughs> what, 35 years later? Yeah. Most of those people have changed and vanished. Most of those objects have changed and vanished. Those places that I went to that were so dear, yeah, they've changed. Some of them have even vanished, right? The dear and delightful does have a tendency to change and vanish. So how are you going to react when that happens? Think about the dear and delightful things in your life right now. Is it possible they're going to change and vanish? How are you going to react? Let's say you have your grandmother's Ming vase and it's sitting on the mantle and there's an earthquake. 
and it smashes to the floor. What are you going to do? Are you going to just grab the broom and the dustpan, sweep it up, throw it away, forget about it? Or are you going to try and glue it all back together? You know, spend hours putting the pieces together. Finally, it's glued back together and looks horrible. Yeah, you wind up throwing it away anyhow after spending all those hours. Yeah, dear and delightful things do change and vanish. You're going to have to deal with it when it happens. So think about the things in the past that have changed and vanished and how you dealt with that. And then take a look at what's dear and delightful these days and how you're going to deal with that. And then the last one on karma. As I said, the word karma literally means action. But at the time of the Buddha in spiritual situation, karma referred to ritual action. So if you were a farmer at the time of the Buddha, uh, in order to have a good harvest, you really needed to get the gods on your side. And it turns out there were some uh, chantings that you could do that would get the gods on your side, but you didn't know how to do those chants. And if you messed it up, oh, that could be disastrous. But lucky for you, there were some Brahmins just down the road there that, you know, for a modest fee, they would do the chanting for you. They'd perform the sacrifices and you could have a fine harvest. This was karma. This was ritual action. And the Buddha comes along and says, karma, I declare, O oh monks, is intention. This is a radical change from the normal understanding of karma. It's the intention behind your actions that really counts. We make this distinction in our judicial system. If you intentionally kill someone, it's a much bigger punishment than if you accidentally kill someone or kill them through negligence, right? So if you break a precept, but you did it unintentionally, you stepped on an insect, you didn't see it. Well, then you incur the karmic consequences of carelessness rather than the karmic consequences of intentionally killing. Now, in the West, the word karma is often confused with karmic resultant. We say, oh, he's got good karma because good things happen to him, uh, implying that he did good things in the past or something, and now he's got these good resultants. But the, the word just literally refers to action, and vipaka refers to karmic resultants. And what the Buddha is teaching is pay attention to what you're about to do. It's going to have consequences. Often people want to use karma as a way to explain why bad things happen to good people or good things happen to bad people. And yes, you can find stories of that in the suttas, but are they just uh, skill, excuse me, skillful means or are they uh, stuff that was inserted later? Yeah, I don't know. But definitely the the thrust of the Buddha's teaching is that actions have consequences. Pay attention to the action you're about to do. In particular, look at your intention behind the action you intend to do. Uh, is it wholesome? If it's not wholesome, well, the consequences are probably going to be not wholesome. And if it's wholesome, hopefully the consequences will be wholesome. Uh, a positive intention doesn't guarantee the action is going to lead to positive results. Uh, there are misguided actions as well done with good intentions. But if you've got a, a poor intention, yeah. Now, there is going to be an immediate karmic consequence of any action. Each action you do reprograms your brain, makes it easier or maybe harder to do that action, right? It, it, to take an, an egregious example, if someone joins an urban gang, the first thing they do is make them go out and commit a crime. 
So they'll get used to committing crime, so they'll be a good gang member, right? Uh, actions have consequences. They become easier to do. So there is a karmic consequence in your own mind with every action you do. And then your action goes out into the universe and there could be something that comes back to you as well. It maybe doesn't come back to you. It just goes out and changes the universe. Every action you do is changing the universe, not in a big way. I mean, if any of you have the ability to change the universe in a big way, you've been messing up pretty bad lately. Okay, but we all get to change the universe at least slightly. All right, so it's like it's, it's a big ship and we all got our hands on the tiller and we can all push it in the good direction or pull it in the bad direction. All right, and there's a whole bunch of people pushing and pulling. So what you want to do is act in a way that makes the world a better place. That's the kind of consequences you want to arise from your actions. So pay attention. The Buddha said that all that we own is our action and their consequences, right? Everything else can be taken from us, but yeah, our actions are programming our minds and the consequences are there. I am born of my karma. This is often taken to mean that there was a me in a previous life and the karmic resultants of the actions done in the previous life, yeah, that shows up as to who I am today. Uh, maybe, I don't know, I don't have any memories from any previous life and I haven't found any data that makes me really certain that there was any previous life, but who you are today, who you have been born as today is dependent on actions that have been done in the past. Some of those actions are actions that you did. You signed up for this retreat. Some of them are actions that, yeah, you didn't do. The fact that I'm speaking to you in English is a result of the fact that the English came to North America they ran off the Dutch, they ran off the French, they ran off the Spanish, and they suppressed the natives such that English became the language spoken in this part of North America. So I wound up speaking that. And the English went all over the world, colonized the whole world, and made English become the international language. So yeah, even though we have people in Berlin, uh, people born in Sri Lanka, yeah, they're speaking English because of the British. That wasn't you doing that, but it was previous action. And because you're thinking in English, uh, it colors your understanding of the world. For example, in English, we don't have a word that corresponds to the Pali word mudita, rejoicing at good fortune. We have Envy, you know, the opposite. So, you know, we don't get taught to rejoice at others' good fortune because we don't even have a word for it. Right? So language definitely colors what's going on. And so previous actions have determined the language you speak. That's just the way it goes. But some of the actions that have determined who you are today, you did in the past and you're now born of those actions. I live supported by my karma, okay? If you have a job, you do your job, they give you money for doing that, you take that money, you pay your rent, you buy your food, you're supported by the actions you do. Pretty simple, right? The actions that we do determine, yeah, the kind of life that we lead. I will inherit my karma. Whatever actions you do, yeah, that's going to change your mind immediately and maybe it comes back to you. Whatever I do, whether good or evil, that I will inherit. Yeah, actions have consequences. Pay attention. People want to use karma to sort of balance the books. Uh, 
to take an example, the United States invaded Iraq back in 2003. That was a pretty karmically evil thing to do. It caused untold suffering. 100,000 to a million Iraqis killed. How many million Iraqis with PTSD? How many American soldiers with PTSD? British soldiers. The rise of ISIS, right? It was a karmically very evil action and it had very terrible consequences. Now, you might be going, yeah, but those guys that decided to do that, they got away with it. Well, maybe so. But if you start looking at karma, not just as my karma or your karma, but the fact that it's our karma, that there's larger ramifications, you do an action, it goes out into the universe and changes the universe. In a sense, you're being reborn with every intentional action. You're reprogramming your brain and your consequences are going out into the universe. Some of what you do, maybe it sticks around for a while. And people appreciate it. Some of what you do yeah, disappears into trivialities immediately. Maybe some of what you do lives longer than your body. So your rebirth is happening all the time with every action that you do. I think it's probably more useful to think of rebirth like this than wondering about your past lives or your future lives or anything like that. So these are the five daily reflections. The Buddha said that every lay that every monk every nun every layman every lay woman should reflect on these frequently so they're often called the five daily reflections think about them daily he also said that everyone should realize that everyone is subject to old age disease and death no one is exempt from these whatever anybody finds dear and delightful will change and vanish. And everybody is the owner of their actions. So to do this as a practice, what you would do is sit down and get concentrated, access concentration if that's available, the jhanas if they're available, but get some degree of concentration and then think about them. As I said, I pasted them into the chat. And if you move your mouse, click on chat, it'll come up and you can copy and paste them into your word processor or something and you'll have them. So you, you sort of got to memorize them because yeah, if you're real concentrated, uh, you know, don't read it off, just remember them. Not that difficult. Old age, sickness, and death. Dear and delightful changes and vanish. And karma actions have consequences. Right? Say them to yourself. Right? And then take one and think about it. Give yourself several minutes to think about the implications of it. And since the Buddha says we should do this frequently, I'm going to require that you work with them at least once a day. These are powerful practices. There was a time at the forest refuge where I would get up in the morning, you know, eat my breakfast, do my yogi job, sit down, get concentrated, say the five daily reflections, whichever one had the most charge. I worked with that all day long. Quite interesting. Uh, interesting insights coming out of it. If you just work with one of these all day long. You don't have to do that. Five minutes is enough. All right. If you want to, you could, you know, take each of them and work with them for a couple of minutes a piece, but at least work with one of them for an extended period of time every day and say them all to yourself. 